Hi, I'm Scott, and this is Great Scott Knitting, a podcast, episode three. If you're new, I want to say welcome, and I'm glad you're here. I hope you enjoy what you see. If you're returning, I'm glad you're coming back. Uh, and I really appreciate return viewers and people that are enjoying this podcast. Today, uh, here in Wichita, Kansas, it is partly cloudy, 87 degrees, and 50% humidity. So it's kind of sticky out there. Really great day to turn down the air conditioning, pour a glass of iced tea, and do some knitting. So let's go ahead and talk about some knitting. Um, over the past couple of weeks, I have finished a whole one object. So um, let me just share that with you real quick. Um, I cast on and completed this shawl. Um, this is the Odyssey Shawl by Hohi Locatelli. It is a really lovely um, garter stitch and um, Shetland lace shawl. Um, it is basically just this garter stitch pattern in, um, in, for this um, crescent shawl. And um, in addition to just this, this nice, loose, airy garter stitch, there is this, um, what is called the crown of glory stitch pattern, um, lace stitch pattern, which is interspersed in between these colors. Um, so uh, when you, ha you, you do get this lovely color work um, as well as the, the Shetland lace pattern. Um, I really enjoyed working on this, uh, this pattern. It's really well written and really uh, easy to understand. Um, you do have these big blocks of garter stitch, but interspersed with that you have this, this lovely intricate lace pattern. Uh, so it keeps your interest really well, even, uh, even given the nature of garter stitch. The yarn I used is Knit Picks Upcycle Reserve Alpaca Blend, which is a 50% alpaca, 30% mulberry silk, and 20% tensile. Um, it is really soft. It's really uh, it has a nice shine to it as well as just this gorgeous drape. Um, so uh, I really do. Um, I recommend this yarn. It was really, really nice from Knit Picks. Um, the colorways that I used were the dark blue is called Lyra. The lighter blue is called Vega and the tan was called Altair. Oh, and one other nice, uh, interesting feature of this shawl is this Pico bind off that it used. Um, which really kind of added some accentuation to the edge of the shawl of those um, Crown of Glory lace pattern. Um, I do have a couple of works in progress. Um, the one work in progress which seems to be just kind of constantly there right now is the Loanger by Cocolat de la Cocolatière. I haven't made any progress on that over the past couple of weeks, weeks uh, mainly because I've been interested in doing these shawl, other sh uh, triangular shawls and crescent shawls that um, right now are just catching my interest. And in this time, I'm really just kind of want to focus on things that are enjoyable for me. And right now, that one's not doing it. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, work in progress that I have is a, another shawl pattern that I'm working on. This one is a shawl pattern called Typhoon by um, Josh Reeks Robinski. It is, again, basically a garter stitch pattern with some, what I'm going to call elongated eyelets in it. Um, offset by these um, colored stripes, which are knit on the bi uh, um, bias. So you have these bias stripes in between garter, step, uh, garter stitch. Uh, 
the bias stripes are produced using uh, German short row, which so you you basically just knit back and forth across the row. Um, so it makes it a, a really um, interesting uh, visually to see those different directions going on. Um, it does, the pattern does call for a self-striping yarn, which would give it kind of a different visual effect. Um, instead of that, I'm using my, uh, a couple of skeins of yarn that I dyed myself. These are both Knit Picks Stroll Fingering Weight or Fingering Yarn. Um, they are 75-25% Superwash Merino Nylon Blend. And these are um, two skeins that I dyed up myself. Um, this one I call Blue Sage. And the variegated one I call Tropical Bird. Um, so uh, these were ones that I recently dyed myself and was really excited about putting them into a project and um, so this is the the project I chose to feature these particular yarns for myself so I'm ex um, happy with how that one's coming along and, and I find them really interesting I have do have some relatively recent acquisitions that I want to share with you this week um, they are some yarn acquisitions the first ones I want to share with you are um, a couple of skeins of Malabrigo that I uh, picked up from Lovecraft website. Um, these are Malabrigo Rios, so they are worsted weight yarn. Um, the first one is Matisse Blue, which is this really lovely, um, it's really much deeper in color in person than the camera picks up. But it's this this gorgeous blue color. Um, interestingly enough, when I originally ordered this skein of yarn, it was not in stock when it came time to ship it, and so um, I kind of went round and round with their customer service to find out um, when it was going to be available, when it was going to ship. Um, at one point, they said, "Oh, well, you know, it's it'll be a few days before we get it in." And then they were like, well, would you like a, you know, would you like a refund or do you want to continue to wait? Um, I decided to wait. And then they sent me an email saying they were giving me a refund. And I was like, well, wait a minute. What if I maybe just want to get a different colorway uh, of the same kind of yarn? And they were said, okay, sure, go ahead, pick another colorway. So I did. And I picked um, the Azul Profundo. Well, while I was picking this, it, like it was in the within five minutes that I received the email that I was like choosing another color. They came back and said, "Oh wait, no, we do have this in stock." So because of the trouble and all the confusion, they sent both, which was really really nice of them. Um, so yeah, I do uh, like the prices that Lovecraft have on yarn. It's one of the more economical places to pick up some Malabrigo, and uh, so I would. I'll definitely come back to them again. Um, their customer service is a little tricky to work with because they are based in the UK, not in the United States. So there is a time difference that we uh, you have to work with if you ever have to work with their customer service. But in general, their um, shipping is great. Um, their prices are, are very affordable as well. Um, so these are a couple of really cool skeins of Malabrigo that I have. Um, that I'm excited to work with in, uh, very soon. I also recently have picked up a, a few skeins of yarn from Knit Crate. However, these are not um, uh, Knit Crate boxes that I subscribe to, but you can also buy directly um, um, sort of other skeins of yarn that they carry in their Knit Crate shop. Um, so I did pick up these two skeins of yarn. Um, these were a featured yarn in the January Knit Crate, but um, I picked up a different colorway at that time. So these uh, skeins of yarn are the uh, Knitology Worsted, and this is a 100% um, Superwash Merino wool. And this colorway is called Concrete Jungle. 
Um, so there's a really pretty uh, naturalish colorway with lots of oranges and tans and yellows in it. Um, so I'm really excited to work with this worsted weight yarn um, and with this really pretty um, sort of natural uh, neutral tone colorway. Uh, so I really like that. I also picked up a couple of skeins of Lorna's Laces Nesting, which is a um, Knit Crate exclusive yarn. Um, this colorway is called Tranquil, and it is a um, sort of a grayish tan, uh, more gray, I guess, than, than tan. And um, a skein of their nesting called in the colorway of Nuzzle, which is sort of a teal color. These um, are both fingering weight or a fingering weight yarn with, and they are an 80-20 superwash merino wool uh, nylon blend. So I'm um, not sure what I'm going to use these for, but I really liked the colors and how they wor would work together. Um, so they'll probably come into a project with some color work uh, that go together. Okay, next up, let's talk about my recent dyeing experiments. Um, of course, um, uh, one of the things that I've started to get into is hand dyeing yarn here at home using primarily I, uh, food coloring through um, either uh, food coloring drops that you would use for baking, or um, in this case, this week I was using Kool-Aid packets for my dyeing, uh, for the dye that I used. So this most recent experiment was using um, Knit Picks Swish DK, which is 100% superwash merino wool. Um, I used Kool-Aid to dye these yarns, and um, the flavors that I used were uh, black cherry, pink lemonade, orange, and lemonade. Um, and that those were the ones that I used on this particular skein of yarn. And the technique that I used for the dyeing of this yarn was, this one was done through hand painting. Um, where I actually just laid the yarn out flat and using a foam paintbrush actually painted the dye directly onto the fiber. Um, going from the black cherry through the pink lemonade, the orange, and the lemonade. So I think that this has uh, created a really nice variegated skein of yarn. Um, I I think it turned out really nicely, um, really pretty, and I'm excited to use this in a project. Um, I'm not sure what I might use it for at this point yet, but I am excited about how it turned out. Um, the second skein of yarn that I dyed in my experiments was a dip dye that I did using the black cherry. And actually, what I, I'm, I kind of what I did with, with this one was I did a double dip dye. So what I did was I um, in my dye pot I put in one packet of cherry Kool Aid, did my dip dye. Uh, of course, it would have been um, undone, and would have dipped it in this direction. And um, so I dip dyed it once in one packet of black cherry. When the dye pot was exhausted and all the color was taken up, I put in another packet of the black cherry and did it again to basically just intensify the colors that were here to give it a little more oomph. And then um, that's what gave me this tonal uh, colorway of four in this black cherry color. I might try and use these two skeins together, um, but I don't know. Um, they might, there might be just enough difference in them that they might play off well with each other. 
or I might just do two separate projects with them. Anyway, these are DK weight, um, 100 grams each. So uh, I really enjoy, I think they both turned out really nicely and I, mean, I look forward to using them in some project. In the next couple weeks, I do plan on casting on another shawl. This time my plan is to cast on the Heartland Lace Shawl by Evelyn Clark. Um, I've knit this shawl before um, and really enjoyed the, the end product as well as the process of the knitting. So this time I'm going to be using a Knit Crate subscription box yarn that I received um, a few couple months back. Um, I believe this was the December 2019 Knit Crate box. Um, the yarn that this is is called the um, Vidalana Lofty DK. So it's a DK weight yarn. Um, it's their Vidalana Lofty base. And the colorway is called Firewood. So it is um, a sort of a neutral toned um, colorway. It has a nice sort of rich um, dark color to it as well, uh, sort of brown in nature. The um, base yarn is 48% merino wool, 20% el baby alpaca, and 32% organic cotton. And the really unique aspect of this yarn is that instead of a standard twist ply, this has a braided quality to it. So the fibers are braided together as opposed to a standard twist. I've never worked with um, this particular style of yarn before, so I'm really looking forward to how this knits up. And I think this colorway will work well with the shawl pattern of Heartland Lace. Um, so I'm looking forward to casting on this shawl in the next couple of weeks and seeing how that turns out. So a um, couple other things that have happened in the fiber world. Ravelry has had an update to its um, image and how it looks. Um, my understanding is it's been about 15 years since they uh, came online and they really haven't changed how um, how they look and feel. So um, they put a lot of work into updating the look of Ravelry. And in my estimation, it was a good change. It looks really fresh and clean and, and just really well organized. Um, I like how many of the features of Ravelry have been reorganized a little bit and placed in some better, uh, better places to make them much more useful. Um, I like the unified look that it now has. Um, and um, simply from reading a little bit about why they made the change and the changes that they have made to the, to the look of the website, um, it should help them be more efficient with making changes and updates to the look and feel of the website going forward, as well as it simply is going to work much better on mobile devices. Um, I've looked at um, the updates through my iPhone and through my iPad, and I really like how it plays now on those devices versus the old version, which was a little hard to use on mobile devices because it was still very much based on uh, a PC layout, and so it made it a, a bit more difficult to work with. So I like the updates. Um, I'm excited to see how they continue to update it and improve it going forward. Um, for those of you who are not as excited about the, the new look and feel to Ravelry, keep working with it. Um, know that, they're, that I'm, I'm sure they're going to continue to make changes to that website. Um, change is not always easy, and I get that. Television watching um, during this period of time. Um, I have been watching a little bit of The Clone Wars still. 
Although over the past couple of weeks, I've taken a little break away from uh, the Star Wars Clone Wars. And instead, um, my husband and I have been watching Hollywood on Netflix. Uh, it was a uh, mini series or, um, on Netflix. It is a period piece based in um, post-war Hollywood, the golden age of the Hollywood world. And it's very much a, um, a series about the inner workings and the power play and power struggles that various types of people in the industry had during that period of time. Um, it highlights uh, the challenges that marginalized people had uh, faced in working in Hollywood, especially gays, uh, women, uh, blacks, um, the differences between writers versus actors and producers and, and movie moguls. So all of these different characters and how they interworked and interfaced with each other during that period of time. Um, and then about midway through the series, it starts making a shift from portraying a realistic look into how Hollywood was during the late 40s to um, more of a fantasy, what if things shifted a little bit and things were better for black actors and actresses and black writers, for, um, for Asians, for LGBTQ, for women, all uh, within the, um, you know, those, those great gold, you know, what are called the golden days of the Hollywood studios. Um, really interestingly done, great acting by a lot of really famous actors and actresses that um, I enjoy watching. So I highly recommend checking out Hollywood on Netflix. Um, another show that my husband and I have been watching this past couple weeks also is the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon Prime. Um, another period piece, only this one is set in the late 50s, early 60s. And the premise of the show is a um, Jewish mother, or a, a Jewish wife, mother, um, housewife, living in um, upper class New York, uh, upper class New York family who her husband leaves her and she finds herself drawn to the world of stand-up comedy and becoming a stand-up comedian. And it follows her through her struggles and triumphs as she enters that, um, that world of stand-up comedy as a woman in the late 50s. Um, it's really interesting. Um, it, it really highlights the struggles that, again, a marginalized person might have uh, breaking into a business which is very male dominated and doing so um, and trying to do, be successful at it. As well as another aspect that I like is the characters, uh, so the main characters are Jewish. Um, the show does not shrink away from their Jewishness. In fact, it is a very integral aspect of the character. And um, oftentimes, the shows that I've seen where the character is Jewish, they really downplay that aspect of their life. Um, this show really celebrates that aspect of the life and uh, highlights it, especially from that period of time. Uh, so I find it, as a Jewish person, very enjoyable to watch. But um, anyone, of course, will, would find this um, funny, um, engaging. The humor is sometimes biting as well as um, just really relevant, even today. So um, another uh, highly recommended film, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon Prime. Musically, um, I like to listen to music when I walk, uh, especially in the evenings. And the past couple of weeks, really the past week and a half, I have been obsessed with listening to um, the John Williams score to Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Um, 
not really maybe the best, the greatest movie, but you know what, in my opinion, John Williams is probably one of the best late 20th century uh, orchestral composers um, and one of the best orchestral composers still living. Um, and uh, hugely influential in my musical tastes as I have grown up. Um, there's one particular piece in this particular soundtrack that I have found quite fascinating and have been listening to um, quite a bit, and that is the, the track called Duel of the Fates. This particular piece of music is used as the background music during the battle between um, Darth Maul, the Sith Apprentice, and um, the Jedi Master, Qui-Gon Jinn, and his Padawan learner, Obi-Wan Kenobi. So here you have two, these two diametrically opposed um, ideologies battling it out in this, uh, in this particular scene where this music is playing. And John Williams really saw this as a bit, you know, in a bit broader concept of being a very, um, very much about the, these ideologies clashing. And because of the religious, sort of the religious aspects of these two, um, of the Sith and the Jedi, he wanted to play up on the religious nature or even sort of the ritualistic nature of the scene of this fight. Um, and have this sort of ritualistic music behind the scenes. And one of the huge differences that this one particular piece of music has within the entire Star Wars saga of music is that it highly depends on the use of a chorus. And um, that is a highly unusual in the Star Wars music world. So what you have prominently featured is the chorus as well as the orchestra. And the text that the, or that the chorus is singing, of course, um, it's not just uh, you know, background oohs and ahs. It, there are actually a text that's being sung, words that are being sung by the chorus. What's really interesting about the text is that it's not in English, but it is also not Star Wars gibberish, as as we sometimes hear in sort of this kind of pop type music that John Williams composed for other scenes. This particular text is from a Welsh poem um, that John Williams had translated into Sanskrit because he found the vowel sounds in the Sanskrit translation to, to um, translate really well into choral singing. So this, the, you know, I find it just so fascinating that this piece of choral music has a Welsh text uh, of this epic poem, uh, ancient epic poem that has been translated into Sanskrit and sung in a modern day, um, sci-fi fantasy film and it's just a, a really uh, a great piece of work um it it stands alone really nicely even simply divorced from its movie context just to listen to it as a standalone piece of work um i think it really uh, works well it holds up well if you've not listened to it um look it up on uh youtube or um, your favorite uh, listening, you know, music device, and uh, take a listen to Duel of the Fates from the Star Wars The Phantom Menace soundtrack. Um, it is a really great piece of, of work to listen to. I, I do find a lot of uh, energy and recharge that comes from listening to music, from knitting, and um, other things, especially in this time where we're, we're uh, challenged by a pandemic, we're challenged by uh, systemic racism and, and police, police brutality and all of these big things going on in our world. 
there are points when we need to recharge and those are some of the ways that I recharge is through music and through knitting but I also recharge through connection to um, my faith and um, some of the things that my faith teaches me I am Jewish and so um, we study the Torah well this week the study of Torah was a particularly interesting and I think relevant uh, piece of text the Torah portion for this week was a portion which we call Shalak which um, for the Christian um, uh, for the Christian uh, Christian numbering of, of the text this would be numbers chapter 13 through chapter 15 verse 41 the key events that are happening within this particular Torah portion, um, what's led up to it is that uh, Moses has brought the people of each of uh, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, out of Egypt. They have received Torah at the uh, Mount Sinai, so they received the law. It's really still pretty new to them. Um, over the over the two, a two year period approximately from gaining their freedom out of Egypt, they are now at the border of of the promised land. They are at the border of Canaan, and this is their first approach to this to the land. Um, during this two years, God has provided everything for the the Israelites. They have had their food provided for them in the form of manna. All they had to do was get up every morning, go out, gather it, bring it back, and eat it. Um, water has been plentiful and provided for them through the uh, Miriam's well. Wherever they would set up camp, Miriam would go and find the water, and it was always plentiful, sweet, and, and good for them to drink. So food and water was never an issue. Um, shelter, of course, they had with them. Protection, they had. Uh, they were protected by God uh, as they went. At, if they marched at night, they were protected by a pillar of fire. During the day, they were protected by a pillar of smoke. So God was always among them, protecting them from uh, other people. So they were safe. They were fed. They were clothed, they were clean, they were privileged. So they get to the border of Canaan, and that's where the, this particular Torah portion begins. Is um, Moses is told by God to send 12 spies, one person eat from each tribe of Israel, into the land of Canaan to bring back a report on how fertile is the land um, how numerous are the people that live there and how are they organized in the land of and so we have an idea of what we're getting ourselves into so the 12 spies go into the promised land they're there for 40 days and they come back and they report to moses and the other leaders of the 12 tribes of, of israel what they have learned well 10 of these, well, actually, let me put it this way. Two of them, a, a fellow by the name of Caleb and Joshua, who eventually does become the leader of the Israelites, they come back and they say, yep, we can do it. There's lots of food. The land is fertile. Um, they brought back examples of grapes and pomegranates and figs, and they're like, you know, it's, it's great. Now, there are there are uh, people there, there are a lot of people there that um, they are warriors, they are strong, but God is with us and God will help us co to conquer them. We can do this. Two people said that. The other ten said there's no way. Yes, the land is fertile. Yes, it's abundant, but there are too many people. In fact, there are giants. They are all warriors. There are no way that our ragtag group of Israelites are going to be able to come in here and conquer this land. Their voices basically swayed over the people. 
And the people said, why are we here? This is too much. Let's go back to Egypt. At least there we knew where we stood. And this angered God. And so God said, enough. Um, no one over the age of 20 will ever enter the promised land. And you are condemned to wander in the wilderness for the next 40 years because you don't trust me. So that's sort of the first portion, the first section of this Torah portion is all about the 12 spies and the people of Israel complaining that, you know what, this, this isn't worth it. We want to go back to Egypt and God saying, no, um, not only you're not going back to Egypt, but you are also not going to get into the promised land for the next 40 years. Everyone who doubts me is basically going to pass, pass away before you're allowed into that land. There's only two people from this generation I'm going to let go in. They are Caleb and Joshua, the two who said, we can do this. Not even Moses was going to be able to enter the promised land alive. At this point, the Torah portion apparently takes a real shift in mood and, and direction and talks about sacrificial laws. Um, basically, sacrificial laws around um, the sacrifice of grains and wine and oils to, at the altar. There's also some specific, um, some, some uh, commandments which are sort of specifically called out, which are of interest. One is the consecration of challah. Challah is a, is a bread that we have every Shabbat. Um, it's a braided bread, usually relatively sweet, um, which commemorates um, uh, the, the sweetness of our Shabbat celebration every week. Um, when that bread is baked, the commandment is to pinch off a portion of the dough and sacrifice it to God, basically burn it um, as a sacrifice to God. So God gets his portion. That is specifically called out in this particular Torah portion. That is an action that is still carried on today by especially Orthodox um, or uh, families and communities that when they make their challah in the home, the person who's baking the bread will pinch off a, a portion of it, usually wrap it in some tin foil and throw it in the oven until it basically disintegrates. Um, so that is basically a tradition, uh, technically a law that is still followed today. What a, probably one of the very few sacrificial laws that's still in action. Um, then it shifts off to another little vignette story about a gentleman who gathered um, wood on Shabbat and was brought before Moses and the judges to say, and basically accused of working on Shabbat, which was prohibited. And what should, what should happen to this guy? And, of course, Moses confers with God. They, God says he needs to be stoned. So the man is put to death. It then moves from uh, that particular punishment for breaking um, the Shabbat laws to talking about another law that is instituted at this point, which is a law... Um, about wearing tassels on the four corners of your garments. These tassels are traditionally called tzitzit, and um, they are still worn by especially Orthodox men um, on the four corners of their garments. Now, what that looks like is um, that they can often will wear, because we don't really have corners on our garments anymore. So what Orthodox men and well, and sometimes conservative men and occasionally even me, a reformed Jew, will wear underneath their clothing is what is called a 
Tully Catan. It's kind of like a little t-shirt that you just wear over your over your head and it basically gives you those four corners where you can always wear your seat seat. The question you might be asking is why? Why would we do this even today? Well, the Torah is very specific in this particular Torah portion as to why we do this. And it's to remember the commandments. They, it, it institutes a physical reminder to follow the law. It's interesting that this commandment follows the killing of someone who broke the Shabbat commandment. Basically, God was in a sense also saying with this law, at least in my mind, if he'd only had something to remind him not to break the law, not to gather wood on Shabbat. Tzitzit, on the corners of your garments, are there as a reminder to adhere to the mitzvah, the mitzvot, the Shabbat, the, the laws that God gave in Torah. So that's the law of the tzitzit, and that's how this Torah portion ends. Really interesting, very nice. What does it mean? Well, here's what this Torah portion means to me. The we often come up against situations that are very difficult. Um, for example, today uh, we are faced with a pandemic which makes life much more difficult for us. We are faced with systemic racism. We are faced with um, police brutality of marginalized citizenry. These things are very difficult. These are, in a sense, the giants that we face that are in between us and reaching the promised land of um, equality and justice for all people. Just like the Israelites were faced with um, giant warriors and they had the mentality that said, we don't have the strength to conquer them to move into that land of milk and honey. Even today, we are faced with our giants and there are times when we say to ourselves, we don't have the strength to fight systemic racism. We don't have the strength to deal with COVID um, and pandemics and all of the other difficult challenging and or injustices that happen in our world. This Torah portion tells us, well, you could turn back and go back to your old ways, but you'll go back into a world of servitude. You'll be in that world. Um, the only way you're going to move forward and be able to reach that which you have been promised is through a change of your mind. You're going to have to change how you see yourselves. You're going to have to change how you see your world. Also, leading up to this Torah portion, I had talked about how the Israelites were taken care of. They were privileged. They didn't have to work for anything. Many of us in this society today are privileged. We don't really have to work for anything especially if you're a white man in American society, life is much easier, especially if you can pass yourself off as a white man or even be assumed as a Christian um, or have wealth. These things give you privileges that other people do not. Um, I am sort of on the border between being a marginalized person and being a privileged person. So I can, in a sense, I understand both sides of that. Before we move forward, those of us of privilege, those of us who have the manna, who have Miriam's well, who have these things provided for us simply because of who we are, because of the color of our skin, or our gender, 
or our religion. These privileges have made us complacent to the struggles and challenges that other people face. For us to move forward as a community, as a society, it's going to require that we change our minds, that we educate ourselves, that we get into the mindset that we can all move forward together, that we all should move forward together. And it's going to take work. Just like the Israelites, um, we're going to have to work to be able to change their mindset so that they could enter the promised land. And it's, whereas in this tour portion, it looked like the second half didn't relate to the first half. Here's where it does. In the second half of this Torah portion, we're given the instruction on how to move forward. We do so by strict adherence to a new way of thinking, to a new way of acting. These laws of sacrifice, these laws that were handed down at Mount Sinai by Moses and God, were new to the Israeli people. They were new to the Hebrew people. They were not used to them yet. And God basically was telling them, only by strict adherence to these laws will your minds change. Will you change inside so that you can move forward into the promised land and claim that which I have promised you? And for us, at least for me, those promises are justice and equality for all people in America, for all people around the world for that matter. Only through this change will we reach that, reach that time and be able to move forward. And it's going to take work. Now, the other interesting thing about it is at the end of this Torah portion, God provides that reminder that physical tzitzit to remind the people what they were committed to, to remind them of the laws that they were to follow, to help them remember where they were wanting to go. Um, I believe that it is also helpful to have something to keep but keep where we're wanting to go in mind so that we can move beyond racism, so that we can um, deal with the pandemics and the challenges of the world that marginalize us and keep us away from where we're wanting to go. Some of the things that have happened over the past couple of weeks that are evidence that mindsets can change and that things can change when we change our mind the LGBT community just had a huge win in the Supreme Court of the United States, a conservative court by all, uh, you know, real thought and process, that LGBTQ people cannot be fired for being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, which is a huge step forward in gaining equality for that, for this community, for my community. Um, and that's important and that's great. And I think we should celebrate that. But as we celebrate it, we should also remember that there are still challenges and struggles for our fellow man. And so we need to keep fighting for them as well. Um, there's still things that we need to fight for our community as well. And one, one of the things where it's seat seat our reminder to stay on the path to keep working because it's been years that the lgbt community has worked for this um in a sense our seat seat is like the pride flag when we started down the road of lgbtq equality um this flag became a symbol of our unity of our struggle of us moving forward and moving into the promised land of being accepted for who we are. I think images like flags, symbols, 
are important and they help us to remember to stay on the path that moves us forward, that keeps us moving in the direction we want to go. And that's why I think this Torah portion was important, even at this point in history, is um, we're faced with giants, but through hard work, through remembering the direction we want to go in and how we want to get there, we can change our mindset to one that takes us to a point where we have the equality and the justice for all people together. Thank you for joining me and hearing my Devar Torah on the uh, Torah portion of Shalach for um, looking at my knitting and uh, listening to my uh, opinions and thoughts. If you like my, my uh, podcast, choose the thumbs up, choose to subscribe. Um, check me out on social media. I have a page on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash Great Scott Knitting. I can be found on Instagram under Great Scott Knitting and on Ravelry as Great Scott KCMO. So thank you for joining and enjoy your knitting.